Thanks, Lisa, for my message this morning. You're welcome. At least get started. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and get started? Dr. Seiberg, uh, would you please uh, call the roll? Sure. Um, Dr. Bullock? Uh, Dr. Childers? Dr. Dempsey? Here. Dr. Fleming? Here. Ms. Janeski? Here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Godwin? Here. Dr. Graham? Uh, Ms. Hyatt? Here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Houston, I think, is not here today. Uh, Dr. Jones? Here. Uh, Mr. Lacus? Here. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Locklear? Here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Loftus? Here. Thank you. Uh, Michael Marr uh, sent me a text. He'll be a couple minutes sure. late, but he will be here. Um, Dr. McIntyre? Dr. Miller? Here. Dr. Weddington? I didn't hear him this morning. And Dr. Wood? Here. Thank you. We have at least 11 and maybe 12 when Dr. Uh, Mar gets here. Yeah. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome commission members, advisors, staff, on-site visitors, and online listeners to the June 14th, 2018 meeting of the North Carolina Professional Educator Preparation and Standards Commission. This commission develops and recommends to the State Board of Education rules related to all aspects of educator preparation programs. My name is Patrick Miller, and I'm the chairman of this commission, and I call the meeting to order. 
Our agenda and materials are available online through the DPI website, www.ncpublicschools.org, on the State Board of Education meetings link. The meeting is also audio streamed through a link located at the bottom of the eBoard agenda. I will now read the ethics statement that is required of us. Commission members are reminded that it is our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest as we handle the work of this commission. Does any member of the commission know of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting? If so, please state them for the record. If during the course of the meeting you become aware of an actual or apparent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on the matter. Commission members, you have had an opportunity to review the proposed agenda for today's meeting. There is one addition to Dr. Seiberg's updates. Do I have a motion to approve this agenda for the June 14th, 2018 meeting? I have a motion from Dr. Dempsey. Do we have a second? Uh, who was that, please? Uh, Mr. Matthew, Mr. Matthew. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second to approve the agenda for today's meeting. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approval, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the agenda is approved. Thank you. The minutes from our previous commission meeting on May 22nd, 2018 have been prepared and made available to you. At this time, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So can I make a motion but ask for I clarification? We approve the minutes, Long Okay, and then I recognize Glenda Jones for a comment. Just on page five of the minutes, I, and I know we'll probably discuss this later, but the, the bottom bullet on page five is what we agreed to on the, at the May 22nd meeting, but the LICN 001 policy that we have posted out there is not, does not align with what we agreed to. So I just want to make that a, just a matter of the, you know, for the meeting. Yes, thank you, Glenn, and, we, and we'll unpack that to make sure that it's in, recorded in minutes here when we actually do the updates for 001 and uh, what, we, what we took to the, to the board. Okay. Yes, thank you. So, Dr. By Jones, second. okay, is your second. So we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes, uh, including the discussion uh, between Dr. Seiberg and Dr. Jones. Is there any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, the minutes have been approved. So now we'll move right into Dr. Seiberg's update. Uh, he will provide. Uh, the Board of Education and Legislative Committee updates at this time. Dr. Seiberg. Thank you, sir, and good morning, uh, Commission members. Um, so we have, uh, I want to go over three things with you today. Um, the first is LICN 001 has to do with the residency model. Um, and in that residency model, um, and, and while I'm doing this, The PDF slide on the overhead that, that got the Thanks. Um, so in LICN 001, um, Dr. Tomlin presented to the board. Uh, it was um, well received, you know, the, the, the strategy and process about the residency license. And again, as a reminder for everyone that we were trying to not completely finish the residency license, that there might be some additional tweaks here and there. Um, that, uh, but we wanted to put some, some stop gaps on it and some framing so that, uh, you know, people out in the field had a basic understanding of what was going on in that process. And before I go into uh, further describing that, um, Glenda and a couple of other folks uh, out in the field um, have communicated with uh, Dr. Tomerlin and myself about um, a difference between what was discussed here in the commission and a, a version um, that was actually put in front of the board. So um, 
uh, Dr. Jones, could you walk through where that is so that we can definitely record that? And, um, and then w my, our intent here would be to make the correction to be in alignment with what the commission was, was uh, intending and also present that then to the board so that we're all in alignment. So on page 14 and 15 of LICN 001, what we discussed at the May 22nd um, commission meeting was the fact that if you look at page 15, which is the residency li license under one, section 1 1.80, if you look at that, number four, what we discussed was making, you know, leaving it the 10 days or the 75 classroom hours um, for kind of to meet the pre-service requirement. But what mo the majority of the districts do in the state is we hire these teachers as lateral entry, which would now be um, consider residency going forward like 2019-20. We hire those folks and we make sure that they get those 10 days of orientation, so to speak, which includes the three days that are required by the state. And then the other seven days are built into uh, maybe effective teacher training, classroom management, lesson planning, all the things that are listed under B there are provided during that 10 days or 75 hours in addition to just normal staff development throughout the school year as a part of the BT or the beginning teacher support plan. What we um, ended up leaving in there somehow in, in the, the policy that was presented was the and, and that needs to be or. It doesn't need to be and, and I don't even know that we should leave it as or it because that's what makes up the 10 days. It could say, um, includes all of those items below in section B because if you look over on page 14 that's where the lateral entry models at and it starts with items 1 through 6 where it talks about providing a two-week orientation that includes lesson planning classroom organization basically those are the same items that have been put over into section B on page 15 and I will tell you that, you know, being as specific as number two under B, where it says an overview of the State Board of Education's missions and goals, that's included in our BT BTSP plan. Our beginning teacher support plan must include that. So in a nutshell there, this cannot be with the way it reads now, which is the 10 days in A, and then it says completion of five days, which makes that look like now we need 15 days before we can put these teachers in front of our students. So we're keeping an uncertified, untrained, well, I say that, not traditionally trained teacher as a substitute in the classroom for 15 days so that we can provide some training here. So that's, we, we did not agree to this at May 22nd. We agreed to the 10 days, the 75 hours, and then districts would make sure that that encompasses all those things under section B. And that included the effective teacher training. Mm -hmm. Those things are always that we already, we utilize these tools to get the 10 days. Right. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And I know that that was the intent of the commission when we, uh, when we put it all together. And it's obviously an oversight. So we'll, we'll, we'll work, uh, I'll work with uh, Dr. Tomerlin and we'll make that correction and we'll get that uh, to the board uh, this next go around. So can I, add, the other part was we were going to add somewhere the 2.7 GPA into the section 1.80 there where, um, you know, is that two point, that's part of legislation, but is the 2.7 GPA going to be the EPP requirement or is that going to be a licensure requirement or is that going to be both? Because as you know now, we currently have a, a way to um, look at either the undergraduate or the graduate degree to determine the GPA right and so that's not specified in there like we do with lateral entry so with lateral entry now I have a what qualifies them and I can look at things such as a relevant degree or 24 semester course hours or a passing score or I can jump over and I can look at a 2.5 GPA on the undergrad or the graduate degree and or five years of relevant so there's there's multiple there's ways options. to get there's options and if we do not capture that in this section, we're going to um, we're going to hurt districts in hiring. If we're just saying bottom line legislation says 2.7 GPA and we do not give us some options of looking at either undergrad or graduate, right? Or is that 2.7 going to be an EPP requirement? 
-hmm. or is that a licensure requirement? Whatever the EPP requires to get in is one thing, but from a licensure standpoint, what I always, what we had to look at was, did they meet the minimum 2.5? And here were some ways they could get to that 2.5. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. So I think, um, I think with these uh, technical cor corrections, yes. So you want to jump in and say that real quick? The board approved the version that Glenn, Dr. Jones is talking about. It's the old version that is. That got posted. Yes, that got posted. Oh, yay. So, so we did have the, OK. So, we, so does that mean then that we, we have everything in place? But is the 2.7 in there in the new version that got posted? I'll have to go out there and look now because I mean that didn't get. I would posted, have to look at that. I would have to right? look at that because that that is critical and that could end up being a technical correction sure. to what the board did approve. So so what I think we'll do is uh, you know there is some confusion about what version is being posted, um, and in that process I think what we can do is we will double check both of these areas. We will make sure that the version on the board uh, minutes is the accurate version. And then we will send, uh, Kim and I will send to all the stakeholders here on the commission the updates. So if there is, if there is a concern about that 2.7 and that that wasn't addressed, we'll make those adjustments and we'll send that out so that you all can see what is going on before we take it to the board if we need to make any changes um, at the next meeting. Yes, and go then on. One more, if we need to add something sure. to that in addition to the 2.7 would be, could we not also include it in section 1.80, just like we do over in the emergency section, the academic year that the residency license can start to be issued, right? So that we're not having to flounder and figure out what year do we start doing that? Do we start doing that in 2018-19 or 2019-20 is when it's required? Right. If you look at section, um, if you look at page 18, the section on emergency license that tells you that it began in the academic year 2017-18. Okay. So, what academic year would we need it to start for residency? Got it. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, we will see yes. that again. Once those changes are made. So, yes, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll make sure that we get the most up to date and get clarity between the intent of what the commission was doing and what was presented was the intent of what the commission was doing. But I think what got posted was maybe a placeholder or something just prior kind of thing. So we don't have the most up to date on the on the board website. So we'll get some alignment there, but we'll also take a look at, at the three areas that, that uh, Dr. Jones has brought forth. And if additional changes need to be made because of those uh, areas that, that she's drawn attention to, we'll send an email to you all to let you know that that's what we'll be bringing to the board. And we'll get some back and forth here before we can, uh, b before we, we go and, and talk to the board again in July. Does that give you some clarity on that? Okay. I do have one more oh, oh, okay. <laughs> on this one. I'm sorry, it's the last one. If you look on 1.81, the residency licensure for currently licensed educators, and, and folks, I just want to make sure that we're thinking this all the way through and fixing it now so that when we get, when LEAs get into this, they're not hindered sure. in any way. So if you look under 1.81, it talks about uh, an individual who holds a clear non-restricted license. and what. If you put that in the mindset right now, that applies to like our JROTC, our CTE. So our CTE folks would get a restricted license, and so they wouldn't be able to add a core area and be able to teach in that. I guess the question there would become, that, you know, putting the word non-restricted in there hinders uh, any applicants that maybe have a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited university. Um, it, from who could meet all the requirements to hold a license in an area, that limits them. So the question would be, can we remove that word uh, since the educator is going to be required to meet all these other guidelines, right, to have the residency license, and now they have to align with an EPP, and they have to go through all the, instead of just having to plan a study now, they have to specifically go through a, an approved program. Okay. So yeah, just a question, maybe we could research that a little bit just to see if that's a word that, you know, we need to have in there. 
um, since now we're going to have all these other strict parameters and requirements with the residency model that maybe that's no longer needed. The, and, and we're talking specifically about the non-restricted mm -hmm. use of the mm -hmm. language that mm -hmm. you're yep. considering there. Yep. And I think and we want to we want to make sure that if we make that change, we don't have a kind of a downstream impact mm -hmm. because sometimes we have folks on restricted licenses who have GPAs less than two right. five, right. or they're in a kind of a T and I right. area where they are not required to have a bachelor's. So I, I think we just want to make sure that if we remove the non-restricted language, that we are in fact covering, so that so that an individual can't through some loophole. Mm -hmm. um, come through with qualifications that wouldn't totally otherwise agreed. qualify them for a full license, and now they've kind of backdoored their way into a, into a full license. Agreed. It is. Okay, so given, and I'm looking at legal counsel here, which folks on the phone can't see me doing that, but given the fact that these are a, a number of changes here, it sounds <clears> to me like we, until we get these worked out, I, I think we need to uh, go ahead, Eric. Sure. Yeah. For the folks on the line, uh, Eric Snyder here, counsel to the state board. I mean, there's some very specific questions that you all are, are raising and talking about the effects of possible changes of policy. And one of the topics on our discussion today will be the new subcommittee structure that's you know, going to muscle up and do some work with this commission. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that subcommittee structure and the way that y'all can do really focused work to really investigate these issues and, and really lean on DPI resources to help, help you get the answers you need so that you have um, the facts you want to make these decisions. Um, so I would suggest um, these sorts of questions and others that may come up as we take a look at these policies uh, that y'all uh, charge your subcommittees to take a look at them and really dig in and can really bring back sharpened issues for the commission to say, we've done the research, these are the questions, and this is why we should do thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, that would be the quick so, thought, so Andrew. Given that that's, given that's our uh, pull, it, uh, pull it down for the July meeting. We're not meeting in July. We, we meet again so, in August. Yeah. So, so the, the question, uh, and again, I'm, I'm talking with Eric and uh, the board council here. Um, the question is, so we've, we've presented these, uh, these changes in 001 to the board last month, and they're up for consideration in July, given these new things that are coming up. Should we not proceed with the board side of things because we're not totally ironed out here? Sure, that would be... Um uh, a commission decision whether or not to uh, pull it so that the subcommittee can do additional work um, or proceed now with the intent to change later. It makes sense to me that if the subcommittee is going to work in July that they can have recommendations ready for the full commission in August uh, that we go ahead and pull it pull LICN 001 from the State Board agenda in July if that's an option. Let the subcommittee make recommendations to Pepsi in August and then the State Board can consider them. So if we go that route, and I, again I'm just thinking out loud, for, for folks out in the yeah. field, if we don't have the, the sort of the guidelines in place over the summer, because basically if, that, if we go that route then it would be going to the, to the board for review and then passage, you know, they'll take another October. two months to do that. We're really looking at October. Is that fast enough? Um, Is it possible for us to see the policy that went to the state, to pull the state board, the policy that went? The one that's on the site right now is incorrect. So can we pull the yeah, one that went? Go ahead. So for those uh, online and visiting uh, here, I'm Jason Weber, also an attorney to the state board. You know, how many attorneys do we need to, <laughs> to figure this out? Um, so, so I have uh, sent a link to the policy that this group recommended and that was presented to the board uh, at its June meeting to Kim, who's pulling that up now. So, so we can have it in front of us at least here. And if for those of you online, if, if Kim, you need to email that around. Uh, please do so. Uh, to Dr. Jones's point, I think it would be helpful to look at what's in front of the state board now and to decide whether that's something that this group wants to recommend.
be pulled or deferred or delayed. Um, you know, one option might be if there are parts of it that, you know, need to go to the board and everyone agrees on and those things need to be implemented quickly, um, that those particular provisions could continue, but this group could recommend maybe, you know, if there are smaller changes to what's in front of them, maybe just pulling parts of it. So let's get it in front of us and then have that discussion would be my recommendation. Yes, because I just pulled it up and this is what we agreed to outside of the additional things like the 2.7 and um, the having the academic year in there. And I personally think that we could go ahead and have the state board approve this one and then, just and then do the technical corrections later with the GPA <coughs> and the academic year and those kind of things because this outlines what we talked about on May 22nd. So if everybody looks at that, they'll see that it really does. It makes me feel better. So then if we use that scenario, the state board would then vote on this policy as is uh, presented in July, and then the licensure subcommittee, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, will then make some recommendations to the full commission in a month or two, and we can recommend those changes to the state board. Yes. And that way we'll go ahead and have the larger framework of the policy in place, okay? Does that work, legal team? Oh, I'm sorry, I did not catch that. This is Jason Weber again. So uh, what Dr. Jones, it, she's read the link that you sent and is, uh, is satisfied that the day requirement, the 10 days, 75 hour requirement is as we discussed and voted upon in May. Her recommendation, and she is actually gonna be the chair of the licensure subcommittee uh, pending the approval of this commission uh, she says go ahead and take the policy as is in July to the state board let them approve it and then if the subcommittee chooses to make additional recommendations let those flow through the normal course of business of the Commission absolutely that sounds like a, a good plan and I do apologize for the confusion with the attachments but I'm glad we're able to uh, resolve that thank you okay and we don't need to vote on that since it was already voted in upon in May. Right. Okay, you can continue with your updates. Thank okay. you, Dr. Jones, for raising those issues. Okay, so um, the one thing that came out of the 001 presentation that Dr. Tomlin did to you know with the board uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago um, was uh, present a uh, a flow chart. Um, with the idea of trying to, to bring some clarity around how these, uh, these new routes, particularly around residency, uh, function. And um, that was the additional amendment that we made to the agenda this morning. Um, we added that this morning, so that is an attachment uh, to the agenda. You can grab these two slides. Um, but the reason I'm bringing to these to you today uh, is, is because Dr. Oxendine on the board uh, suggested that we make sure that, that we're trying to get feedback from the field as, as best we can about this process and is it clear and, and clearly understood and so on and so forth. So um, in, that, in the, the PowerPoint, the two slides that you'll see, um, the way we have this set up, again, is, is just a flow chart to sort of organize some of the uh, strangeness that occurs with all the variables, <laughs> uh, depending on uh, the various uh, license opportunities that you have. Um, so the first slide that, you, that you'll see there is the traditional route, which is a very easy, you know, uh, point A to point B uh, process that everybody understands and obviously doesn't need much explanation. Um, the bottom portion of that we'll see um, essentially an alternative route to the traditional route, right? And in that process, um, you'll see uh, effectively three avenues that you can, uh, you can move towards, and they are triggered by uh, effectively the amount of hours that you have relative to, to content area. So um, the permit to teach is effectively, I need a warm butt in, in, a, in a seat. Uh, you know, I, I've got, I have nothing, nothing else here. You know, I need somebody in there instead of a substitute, and that would be a person that would be come in, come in. And by the way, in all cases, this is a person that has an undergraduate degree, um, and they are, uh, they get employment with the LEA. If they have less than or fewer than 18 uh, hours of coursework, 
they would be given a permit to teach. So that would be the earliest uh, and the first course of action that you could take. Um, and the, if you had between 18 and 23 hours, you would then move from the relevant uh, you know, uh, permit to teach option into the emergency licensure option. Um, and if you had 24 hours of content uh, or more, then, and you are enrolled in an EPP, at that point you would be starting down the path of residency license. So this first slide then is, is basically trying to show how the three options are, are, are put out there. And the reason that we, that we have this set up, obviously, is to provide the LEAs the most flexibility that they can possibly get. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you start with a permit to teach, that's a one-time non-renewable, um, gives you a year to, to tinker and get them up to speed to move towards the residency license. That's a one-year non-renewable, and that gives you another year to move from there, and then you move into residency license after that. So again, trying to give, you a, give the LEAs as much flexibility as they possibly can have in that process. Any questions about that portion of the, of the flow chart before we go to the second section? Good with that? Second slide, this is, it's, it initially it's, it looks a little bit confusing, but um, if you look, again, if you look at the top, that's the, the, the traditional route, and now we've essentially divided, up, divided it up by years, right? So in a traditional route, you would get uh, an initial professional license, and that would, that would flow for three years, and that, at the point that you concluded and, and met all your obligations and so on and so forth, you would move from an initial license to a continuing license. In the case of the residency license, effectively, if you are in a residency license mode at any time along that way, if you pass your license areas, um, you're currently enrolled uh, and you're recommended for license and you meet those obligations, you effectively would move from the residency license into the initial professional uh, teaching license. And so that's why we have those, those uh, sort of diagonal lines there because um, you know, that can be an ongoing, you know, you could be in residency for less than one year or a year and a half or two years, but at some point you've, meet, you've met all the requirements in the residency route and satisfied the EPP obligations, um, at which point if you're not at the third year of your teaching, you would be moved into the initial teaching license. Um, and at the end of uh, the residency route, um, you would necessarily move to a continuing professional license because you would have done three years of working uh, towards that end. So this is just sort of, again, a visual representation of uh, the differences between the, the residency route and, again, trying to bring some clarity to how it relates to a traditional route uh, to ho hopefully help the field out in, um, in understanding the process. Andrew, Questions? Yes. When you reference the license exam and the gold box, that's content. You're, is you, that proxy for content? Yes. Yeah. Because EdTPA is not in that. Um, that would be it, it, EdTPA and PPAT as an option are a part of licensure, you know, going forward because residency license has to meet the obligations of the EPP and the, all the EPPs uh, have to have that in place as well. So yes, EdTPA would be included in that process. It's the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there. Yes. So the only concern I would note with this is when I love the flow chart, mm -hmm. but I guess the concern I have here is we're giving a little bit extra time to our non-traditional people to pass the test than we are to our traditional folks. So our traditional folks have to pass everything by the end of year two. And with the um, residency model or our current like lateral entry or whatever, these folks get to the end of year three to be able to pass everything. And if mm -hmm. you look at that middle section there where it says pass, on the traditional route, they have to pass everything at the end of year two, uh, even though their license goes to the end of year three. And we, we did discuss this before and I think you know, that was just something, to, a point to put on the table is that we're treating the two different, treating them differently. We're, we're giving them different requirements. Um, not to say that's all mm -hmm. bad because there are some Can folks, that, districts that, that support I that. I just to let Linda know, I did bring that up at the board meeting when the flowchart was presented to the school board. I also noticed that and, you know, was a little concerned that I felt like 
the um, traditional route was not being treated um, as fairly as I felt like they should. So, yes, and, and so the question there, I, I think, I think that it, 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 there's going to come a time that I, I guess a, a default here would be that the, that the residency route be in alignment with the current traditional route, which would mean that we would need to alter that um, to, to two years and not three. Um, but the idea, the hope, I, what I've heard from the field is that could we get the, the both of them to be at three years and not two, which that's would be in alignment with the initial professional mm -hmm. license. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the biggest part there. We would love for it because, the, as you just said, the license is a three-year license. Mm -hmm. And right now, districts are faced with, what do I do with teachers who have not passed the test in their year, end of year two mm -hmm. by August 15th, mm -hmm. if they've not passed the test, even though they have an entire year left on their teaching license, mm -hmm. They now are not eligible for employment in the school district. Right. So right? Some of that's statutory. It is absolutely it is. in law. Is. That is correct. That's so we there. we will not be able to undo. You know, we we've we've voiced the concerns that we have to to the various lines of communication to to uh, to consider that. But right now, that is a part of law. Yeah. So I guess my question there would be, since that's a part of the law, how do we have the option then to not treat the, the residency model people the exact same way that we're tra tra the, as traditional, so right? I, well, or go to two year. Yeah, but well, yeah, they either have to be two year. Why do they get three years to pass the test since it's in law? I agree with you it's in law. And lateral entry currently have to align with the traditional and pass it by the end of year two. How do we have the option to do something different with our residency folks than what we're required by law to do with our traditional folks. So, so I don't want to, right? So, so clearly, I don't want to disincentivize traditional preparation, right? But I think the piece we have to remember is, if I'm in a residency program, I'm still in a program, right? And so, you can't be expected necessarily to complete the licensing exams until you have completed the program. Whereas a traditional completer has already completed their program. So they complete the program, they have a year post program to pass those licensing exams. If I'm in a residency program, in my residency program that I have designed as an EPP in conjunction with, with an LEA is a two year program, I wouldn't expect my residency folks to be taking those licensure exams necessarily in the first year of their program or perhaps even early on in the second year but rather when they complete the residency program right so I, I think we need to think about that as where um, yeah there it, it appears that there are two different rules being established for traditional and an alternative but in fact the alternative folks are in a program in an approved IHE I don't, I don't know if this is also trying to point out too is just those teachers are uh, employable for one more year through the residency model uh, versus a traditional uh, pathway which they may be unemployable that third year and they've completed the four years they have already completed and a program mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's just one of the important piece for the individual so I agree here about, about the two being two different programs but it's exactly what Wesley just said. I, so now I've had a tr person that's completed a traditional program. They've done everything they're supposed to do except finish the test, right? They've attempted, and, and I know we're addressing the math test for our elementary mm -hmm. folks. Now they're not employable for another year, even though they have a license sure. at the end of year two. And I agree with you. And, and to some degree, that's on the IHE, right? Yeah, well. Right. If I've got if I've got inordinate numbers of graduates not completing licensing exams, then as an IHE, I have an obligation to those graduates to help prepare them for that exam. I agree. Right. Whether we like the exam or not, whether the exam is fair or not, right? That's something for this commission to debate right. later on. But in fact, if if that part of that obligation is on the IHE. And, and I agree with all of that. It's just at the LEA level, I have just decreased my pool of, or of teachers for the next school year. I've taken this teacher who has been effective in the classroom and done a great job with the students. And at the, by August 15th this year, if they have not passed the test, and I agree, we can't, we, so, we, the problem is for a whole more year, these folks cannot be employed in my LEA I, other than under substitute pay. I'm, I'm also curious, as to the number of individuals that this is actually impacting, right? Because if we look in the secondary areas, for example, 
Praxis II pass rates are in the upper 90s, right? So we're talking about very small numbers of candidates, I believe. So perhaps the issue is really about elementary education. And if we can fix the test, uh, the math test in particular, then perhaps that helps alleviate some of the burden, some of the pressure that, that folks are feeling. Yeah, and I just just for the record, I mean, I know that uh, Dr. Tomlin is in the middle of, of conducting the analysis to figure out whether it's, uh, you know, 12... Uh, 12 people or uh, 1,200 people. So once we get that number, um, and I, yeah, it, I then worry we can a little certainly bit. send that out. That would help inform the discussion. Yeah. For sure. I mean, it's very few for Cabarrus now because right. we've really worked with ours. But I'll tell you, when I did survey the state, and that's been too, probably early May, we had some of our larger districts that had up to 94 folks in there. Some mm -hmm. of the smaller districts had large numbers in there. For Cabarrus, it's... Right. It's minimal, and, and we're going to work through that, right? But for some of our large, and it may be a mute point now, too, because maybe since May, they've had all these folks that have passed the test. You know, to add one point to what you said earlier, either way it's on the IAG, um, because ultimately they all, in a, oh, in a good agree. world, would land certified. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that if ultimately the person is going to fail the test, we've given the resident one more year to fail the test. And the traditionally prepared person didn't have that one more year to get to that unsatisfactory outcome. So I do like the idea of extending it out for, uh, if the numbers are that small, we're talking about a very small number of teachers that this is gonna impact, but it gives much more flexibility to the LEAs. And the traditionally prepared teacher who can't pass the test in the abstract, becomes the most qualified resident. That, that was sort of where I, in the instance that you get to year two and you don't pass the licensure exam and license expires, I'm curious, Glenda had said it's just, you become a substitute teacher, which I think you can pay those people up to a dollar less than, than a, the beginning teacher pay. but. Are there other routes that that person could take to stay in the classroom besides sub? Well, my understanding with the residency process is that you can't like go back and go back to an emergency permit. You can't go back okay. so like that's... like it's a it's a one way street. Sub <laughs> is the only option then. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Andrew, can I ask one more question about pay the go back to the page one of the flow chart there, where if you look under the alternative route there um, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to give the 24 hours relevant coursework or the test as an option whereas um, that that should have been an option to either have 24 hours or pass the test to qualify for like it is now for lateral entry they could have 24 hours or pass the test to qualify as a qualifier for for residency and i don't see that um, you're saying you, you would like to see that in the first green box? Is that where what you're it says saying? 24 hours met, in, enrolled, or, or up at the top where it says 24 hours relevant coursework, enrolled in an EPP. Somewhere in here it needs to say, not in addition to the 24 hours, it needs to say 24 hours or have passed the test, right? Because that's an option right now unless we're taking that away as a commission. Well, I mean, yeah, I know you'll need to look at Yeah, that. I have to check that, but um, yeah, certainly it would be in alignment with what we have in, in, uh, in the policy, and, and I'll, I'll double check that. Yeah, because now it says 24 semester hours of coursework in the teaching area or passing score on the North Carolina State Board of Education approved licensure exams for the teaching area. Okay. Yeah, so we can, we can definitely add that to the flow chart for sure. Andrew, did you say we have access to that now? Should be, you mean this flowchart? Yes. That should be uh, an attachment that's on the the agenda. It uh, yeah, it was added this morning. And we can also, if, if it's helpful, we can probably zap it out to everybody who wants to. So again, the intent the intent here was to, you know, again, Dr. Oxendine wanted to get feedback from the field. I think we're getting some good feedback here. And know that uh, 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 Dr. Tomlin will work to push that out across uh, the various HR systems within the state to get some more feedback as well, and then bring bring that feedback back to both this organization uh, as well as the board um, going forward. Okay. 
So that's, uh, that's the, our updates on 001. Um, the other item that, that went to uh, the state board was adjusting the, uh, the program approval process. Remember that at the EPP level um, or the, the entity level, to become an initially authorized uh, EPP, you have to get um, board formal board approval. You have to get um, uh, feedback from peer review, um, and, and the the board has to, or the, not the board, the, the Department of Public Instruction has to provide um, support for an entity trying to get initial authorization. Um, but those rules do not formally apply to the program level approval process, which has been. Uh, a very sticky and laborious process for everybody involved. Uh, know that when Dr. Tomlin presented uh, what was provided by the commission and approved by this commission uh, for consideration, that uh, there were there were was no no pushback on that process, and we expect that that would be uh, approved in July. At which case, that would that will change how we do our uh, program approval process, and I'll work with my colleagues Kim and Teresa. Uh, to adjust that uh, to make an online system um, that is uh, more uh, easily consumable from uh, the EPP perspective. Um, so that's a little bit on uh, 004. Um, so the, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to draw uh, folks' attention to, because uh, it was it, I was getting some feedback and I, I wanted to make sure that folks here understand uh, what was going on, was this week, um, Internally, uh, with the legislative evaluation team, um, the legislative evaluation team um, periodically uh, has an, a, a series of things that it wants to audit uh, based on the will of, of, of the lawmakers to follow up on how things are going, so on and so forth. So last fall, um, the uh, educator uh, reporting, educator preparation program, sort of like the the IHE performance reports and the report card system, how we report data on EPPs um, was audited. And in that audit, uh, that they concluded that audit and, and produced a report, and that report was given to the Joint Legislative uh, Program Evaluation Oversight Committee. Um, and in that process, uh, long story short, they, they identified some areas of, of uh, that could be better. Essentially, they were saying that, that we collect a ton of information, and rightly so, because, because North Carolina does. And the, the way we, we publicize that data is not particularly effective. In other words, if you want to look across institutions or in meaningful ways to look at comparisons and, and think dynamically about data across institutions, it's very difficult to do because we create it in a series of static documents. Um, and so, uh, um, that was among uh, other uh, things that they brought up. But um, in that process, there was a, a model that the auditors created, which is to basically say one way of thinking about uh, taking this data and, and creating a dashboard that would be helpful is this model. And in that model, there were a number of limitations in that model. Um, and uh, I just want to make sure that this commission understands, and I also said at that, uh, that education committee, um, that task force, that, that uh, the model that they presented was not the recommended model or the model that is preferred. Instead, what they were trying to do is, you, is say, you have all this data and you can collect it and you can create dashboards and uh, a variety of, uh, of visual uh, analytics that could be helpful. Uh, forget about that this is, this is the one we use to demonstrate that you can do these things and less about this is the only way we're going to do things going forward. Um, and there was a little bit of confusion about that in the, in the meeting, so I, I tried to provide clarity there. What I want to make sure that this commission understands is that um, in the, the presentation, there was a, um, an effort to try and uh, assure that th this department would have a plan, and that plan would be the preferred model by fall of 2019 that th then would go over to, the, to this uh, education committee uh, for consideration and so on and so forth. And my intent in that process is to include as many stakeholders as I can in that process, large institutions, small institutions, 
non-institutions, so, so educator preparation programs that don't necessarily uh, lead to uh, degrees. You know, every, every stakeholder we can possibly put in that process, I would like to have, you know, a, a group that thinks very carefully about that and, um, and that will be the, the effort that we will bring forth to the board um, and we're not there yet. So I just, want, I just want to make sure that everybody, if there was ever any concerns about, holy cow, this is the way we're doing things, this is, you know, there were, you know there's some panic out there about how that was set up. Um, and that was not the intent of the audit, um, and that was not the intent of the presentation yesterday. So I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to that. Um, Dr. Marr, you were at that session. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that discussion? No, I, I, I thought the, the concerns um, were, I guess, brought out pretty well by Dr. Williams from the Independent Colleges and University. Um, and essentially, I think there was some concern, at least from folks that I spoke with, around that model uh, in particular and the fact that some institutions were not included in the model, non-traditional providers were not included in the model, um, and that... I'm sorry, could you speak up? This is Connie, yep. I can't hear. Sorry, uh, yeah, I was just stating that the, some of the concerns included the fact that some institutions weren't included in the model, non-traditional preparers were not included in the model. Part of the equation was folks that uh, the graduates didn't stay in North Carolina got dinged. Right. So an institution and like Duke University would, you know, got really hit by the fact that all their their folks are basically sure. national. And, and it was almost as though some of the criteria could be somewhat arbitrary in that if I change some of those criteria, those quote unquote rankings could dramatically change. Right. And so um, my concern in particular was that, you know, I feel like it's the work of this commission to establish what those criteria should be uh, if we are going to end up with a model that has some outward-facing report card, um, that we, we have the capacity within this commission to do that work and hopefully will be called on to do that work. Mm -hmm. uh, one other note that I, I wanted to draw your attention to was there was some concern, particularly from the private uh, uh, universities, um, about the, the, the way 599, Senate Bill 599, worded uh, the, uh, the flow of data for reporting was that it would go to the UNC dashboarding system, which is a system that's run by uh, EPIC. Um, and uh, th this commission needs to know that there is a current bill going through the various chambers right now and getting uh, permissions to hopefully uh, come to fruition. That, that will effectively do away with that process, that it will, the data will be uh, held here within the department and it will not necessarily go to the UNC system, which was problematic for the privates on a variety of, of levels. And that was my understanding based on Representative Horn's comments at the end of that committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I just, that, that was the, uh, the additional item that of, of note that I think this commission um, could benefit from hearing. Andrew, and does that mean the dashboard as it exists would come under DPI? It means, yeah, yeah, that's my understanding. It doesn't mean that the UNC system won't continue its own dashboard, um, but there were some, there were some problems associated with how we would uh, manage that. It's just the flow of traffic was problematic for a variety of stakeholders. So they, they may continue to operate a, U, a, a UNC dashboard that may or may not have the, the same things that they want, or they may have different things than what we're trying to do. But the intent now is that it, it resides within DPI, right. at least yeah, in the current And bill. I think the metrics could, could potentially be different between what the UNC system is trying to collect mm -hmm. and what the Department of Public Instruction is trying to collect. Yeah. So yeah, so even if I, I think what the, I, I'm putting words in their mouth, but I think what they were saying is, this is really neat because it's not dynamic and interactive, and we can do things a, a bunch of different ways. And can we do something like that? And um, that's that we're going to try and get to that point with some some business intelligence on this end. That's our goal, um, and hopefully that'll clear that up. And uh, the point is that it's not it, it was a thorn for uh, the private institutions in particular, and and it looks like it's being addressed in uh, the most recent bill. Yeah. So this may or may not be the, the right place to ask this question, but if, if someone, is, does this apply at all to folks that are maybe hired from out of state? So let's say we have somebody that's working at an out of state university to complete their degree or whatever, or non-traditional route. So they're assigned to, they're with an out of state university, 
does that, do they somehow have to still align with a North Carolina EPP, right? So if I've got a um, applicant that's already working on their MAT at, say, Liberty University or Grand Canyon University or something like that, um, and, a, and I want to hire them in Cabarrus County, does that person now have to align and go through the residency model? Because they don't currently have to do that. Um, do they have to associate with a university in North Carolina that's been approved as an EPP? Never done that. Uh, this is Tom Tomberlin, Director of School Research Data and Reporting. Um, no, they do not have to align. Well, in order to complete the residency model, they would have to align with a North Carolina State Board of uh, Education approved EPP to do the residency model. If they were going to do it, if they're a degree seeking um, candidate, then and, and they're going to Grand Canyon University, um, reciprocity goes to the fact that the ed prep program is regionally accredited and so we'll say that is an approved by extension that's approved by the state board of education and we will recognize your preparation that person would still be required to take all north carolina licensing exams right. but the way the residency model works it has to be a state board of education approved epp in order to to to, to meet the requirements for the residency model. So all those universities that are currently regionally, so like a Liberty University, that's a, uh, a private university in Virginia, and I'm work, the, the applicant's working on their MAT there that does not lead to a teaching license, right? They're still, they're not going to have to, or I, do I think I hear you saying they're gonna have to align with an EPP here? If they're seeking, just they're, if they're doing the residency route, if they're getting an MAT mm -hmm. um, and part of that degree seeking is to seek licensure okay. um, at the end of it, then, then they would be, if they're regionally accredited, um, they should be fine. But I, I think the way the law is written that a, um, any EPP that's functioning as a, as a sponsor of a residency license has to be State Board of Education approved directly, not, not through reciprocity. Okay, so those schools are not going to have to come back now and apply to go through and be approved by this commission as an EPP because they're already regionally accredited. I guess that's the question because now we're supposed to be approving as a well, commission that you It's really about whether or not you're going to employ them. So if they're, at, if they're at a university outside of North Carolina and they're doing a degree program and they're going to student teach in North Carolina, then they don't have to affiliate with anybody they True. go through right. the normal process if however you're going to hire them as a resident then my understanding is they would have to affiliate with a north carolina university or that university has to go through our process and become an approved provider in north carolina that is correct and the opportunity for an outside a, a, an entity external to the state of north carolina that is that process is available to them they could because so uh, I know um, Ohio State University recently contacted us about some of their program. Um, they have the right to apply as an EPP for the purposes of supporting residency licenses. Um, w they do not have to apply to us to become a recognized EPP for traditional prepared applicants. Okay. Thank you. Well, they do have to meet the language that pertains to us relative to things like you have to have a field and clinical structure, you've got to have relationships with school partners. That language that's in, uh, it's, it's in the bill and it's in policy. If they're supporting residency models, they would have to demonstrate that to and us. And if there are any, if they, to become, to be or become an approved EPP, they would have to, in essence, meet the same expectations we would have of an institution based in North Carolina. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, the same, and have the same accountability measures. And have the same structures Everything. and have the same expectations for things mm -hmm. like field, clinical, school, university partnerships, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. There has to be clear and compelling evidence they have that. Good. Yes, uh, that, that concludes our updates. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Seiberg. We will move into the subcommittee update.
Uh, during the April meeting, uh, I discussed the leadership selection for the subcommittees, and today I would like to announce the appointed chair and vice chair for each of the three standing subcommittees under our priority areas. Uh, just as a reminder, the executive uh, committee is already in place. Uh, that's Dr. Michael Marr, Dr. Ann Bullock, and myself. Uh, for the first subcommittee, it's educator preparation, and the chair is Dr. Van Dempsey III, and the vice chair is Dr. Ellen McIntyre. Uh, for the licensure subcommittee, Dr. Glenda Jones uh, will serve as chair, and Dr. Hank Weddington will be the vice chair. For the assessment and performance subcommittee, Mr. Andrew Lockus uh, is chair, and Dr. Wesley Wood uh, will serve as vice chair. And thank you to those commission members who have agreed to serve in these leadership capacities. Uh, during the months of June and July, the subcommittees will have the opportunity to, opportunity to meet and discuss relevant policy needs or concerns within each of the three priority areas. Prior to any subcommittee meetings, the chair and the vice chair from each subcommittee will meet with Dr. Kim Evans and Dr. Andrew Seiberg to discuss subcommittee protocol and possible work topics. And that meeting does not have to be face-to-face. -face. It can be teleconference. Dr. Evans will reach out to each chair by Monday to plan the subcommittee leadership meetings, and then the full commission will reconvene in August to have a sharpened, focused discussion and to consider recommendations from the subcommittees. Any questions surrounding the subcommittees? Hearing none, uh, we will now hear a presentation from Mr. Eric Snyder, General Counsel to the State Board of Education. Eric will be speaking regarding the legal aspects of public meetings and public policy making. Eric. Good morning, Commission members. Uh, my name is Eric Snyder. I'm counsel to uh, the State Board of Education, and along with Jason Weber, we are uh, your attorneys advising this committee. Um, today, I'd like to talk a little bit about legal governance for the Pepsi Board, excuse me, the Pepsi Commission, as well as talk a little bit about subcommittees. So we have a, a short agenda. Um, for those who are following online um, or via phone, you can see the uh, presentation on the website. Okay, so let's talk first about public records. Um, you all are a public body. The documents you make are indeed public records. Uh, we, this commission does its work in the sunshine and uh, we provide those things to the public as they're, as they're interested in them. Um, so for example, the documents you create, whether they are emails, texts, papers, you know, whatever it is, if it's in the process of this work that you're doing for Pepsi, uh, regardless of its physical form or its characteristics, it is a public record. Um, it might be on your personal email, it might be on your institution email, you know, wherever it lives, um, if it's in furtherance of this board, it is a public record. Um, so one thing, to, one thing to think about as you fire off emails related to, related to your work here. All right, so uh, again, really any number of examples of what, what these things can be. So if you're working with your colleagues via text or you know, sending messages from your iPad while you're watching Netflix and it's on company business, just think about that. Um, I will tell you I've been in private practice before coming into um, this public sector job. So I've read a lot of people's emails as a litigator. And you know, it's always just a good rule whether you're in this room or working in business or wherever if you don't want it if, if if you wouldn't want your mother to read it in the top fold of your hometown newspaper i would just be careful that's a time to pick up the phone and have that conversation rather than put it down in print i think probably just about every attorney would give you that same advice um, but in any event you can see these examples here and i won't i won't belabor those okay but what's not public um I'll play the lawyer card first. If we have a legal issue where uh, Jason or I is providing you or other commission members advice about this work, 
that can fall within the attorney-client privilege and those kinds of documents are ones that we would withhold. Uh, tax records, for example, uh, to the extent there are trade secrets claimed by groups that this group interacts with, query whether that would happen, but it's possible. That would be something if marked properly, wouldn't necessarily be public. Um, of course, personal information uh, concerning social security numbers, um, uh, any sort of electronic pay payments, all those things that might tangentially end up in, in your inbox related to this kind of work we would keep out of um, sort of that public realm. Um, a lot of these really don't apply necessarily to the work you're all doing. Um, but as you think about licensing folks, um, some of the criminal investigative records that you might look at as examples um, or medical records might be, or personnel records, those things would generally out of sort of the public record realm. And that's, that's a matter of law. Um, you know, to the extent you'll have different school information about students, uh, frequently we've got a whole body of law uh, that rules certain school and student information outside of the public record realm. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with those things. So of course, student personal identifying information, um, you know, EC records uh, that are, involve kids with um, you know, sort of mediated settlements, other special ed records, criminal checks, um, emergency, res emergency response plans. Again, these aren't things that are exactly in your lane, but it's just a useful piece of background. And so when we talk about public records, what do we really mean? Um, who can get them? How do they do it? And truly any member of the public can get a hold of these kinds of records. Uh, it's the public's business. Um, they have the opportunity to inspect or receive, again, in any media format available. Um, and again, I think there's a, there's a piece here I, on the presentation about those requests occurring at reasonable times with reasonable supervision. I mean, some, Joe Public can't walk in the building and hop into my file cabinet. That's just not how it works. We're going to be reasonable about these things. Time to respond. Um, Again, there's a reasonableness factor here um, in, in a matter of responsiveness. And a lot of times this is about resources and the scope of the request. Um, now, you all in your positions as commission members may get direct requests from the public or from uh, your colleagues who may be interested in this work and they might want more than just the cursory update. Lean on DPI to help you out with those requests. We don't need you all to, you've got enough work to do um, short of becoming your own public records uh, responder, learning all those rules. So forward those requests to DPI Communications. Um, Andrew or Kim can forward those to, to me or our communications director here who will help facilitate uh, responses to those requests. We do have a, a approach where we try to respond very quickly to the requesters to know, hey, we got, we got, your, we got your request. Let us investigate and we'll get back a plan to you uh, in a reasonable time and sort of sort through what's an appropriate ask versus something that might be unreasonable, seeking information that's not there. A lot of times we'll have folks who make a records request for information that's already posted and it's just a matter of redirecting them to the appropriate place on the website. And uh, again, if you all get those requests, send them to us. That's not something that you should have to have to work with. You have plenty of other uh, other responsibilities. Um, but sometimes we'll see requests for email archives and that's something that we work through with our, our communications department. Okay. When it comes to reasonableness, um, there are a number of considerations. Um, there are, uh, you know, sometimes if a request is particularly large, we'll ask the requester to pay certain fees to help defray those costs. Again, those are reasonable ones. Um, with respect to verbal information, what that means is if someone comes in asking a question, say, show me all this right now, uh, respond to this public request, agencies across the state have the opportunity to respond in writing, not to drop everything right then and there, but in fact, take time to create an appropriate response. Um, and that's uh, to ensure that we're um, responding appropriately and timely and, and in, you know, in, in the scheme of all the work that folks here in the agency do and that you do, it gives, a, gives time for a measured response, an appropriate one. Um, and there's also this, you know, we don't have to 
uh, create records if one doesn't exist. So if someone comes in and asks for a particular report that hasn't been made before, I'm sorry, we can't respond to you because it hasn't been created yet. Um, another request uh, uh, sometimes people make uh, for information includes both public information and non-public information. And that's a consideration in, in uh, the response time from the agency. And you could see that with respect to um, data that might come to this board about particular kinds of applicants who are illustrative of different sorts of programs or different sets of um, credentials and the like. So we would, if there was a request for information like that, if it existed, um, the communications team here would suss out the public and non-public items in order to respond. Okay, so what if someone makes a request for public information and is dissatisfied with the response? Um, they can seek in order to compel the release of that information, and um, in, in some instances, they can receive attorney's fees. So that is a very quick overview of public records, but I think the quick takeaways are, if I'm doing it in, in, in furtherance of this commission, it's a public record, wherever it lives, and if I receive a request, I'm gonna reach out to Andrew or Kim and They'll, they'll help me take care of it and it's off my plate. That's sort of the quick overview, overview for the commission members. Any questions on that? And probably many of you are already familiar with it. Okay. Hearing none, let's talk a little bit about open meetings. Again, since you all are doing uh, public works, um, we have clear rules on open meetings and, and um, you're already familiar with many of these formalities because you you live them month to month. All right, so again, uh, we're talking about meetings of public bodies. And again, any, your commission falls clearly within that realm. Um, who's got to follow these open meetings laws that are on the, on the statute book? Certainly our state board, Pepsi, uh, your friends and colleagues on the Council on Educational Services for uh, EC Kids, uh, our Charter School Advisory Board, our textbook commission. Um, we list these folks, you're probably already familiar with them, but um, if you want to sort of shake your head about going through some of these formalities, these folks will, uh, they, they will commiserate with you. Um, okay, so which meetings is really the important question, in particular as we talk about uh, your subcommittees getting launched here soon. So true public meetings are those ones that are, we're talking our official meetings like this one here where a majority of members are gathered. Uh, so long as the purpose of the meeting is really the business of the, of the body. So that could be legislative work, it could be uh, policy making as you all do. Um, I, I don't think you all do a, have a quasi judicial function. Those kinds of meetings are usually public. Administrative advisory work, you know, if this group is gathering in furtherance of this commission, it's going to be a public meeting. Um, it doesn't matter when, where, or how the meeting's held. Um, if it's off-site uh, or over at another institution, again, that would be classified as a public meeting. Okay, so what should we be doing? Um, now, the folks here at DPI are going to take care of most of the mechanics of setting up these public meetings uh, in, with the consultation with the chair, um, but we'll provide public notice on the eboard site that you're already familiar with that includes time, date, and location for your meetings. Um, you know, it the, the amount of notice necessary for a meeting depends on the kind of meeting it is. Your regularly scheduled meetings are posted with great regularity, just like clockwork. We know the calendar, we put those things up, it's announced, uh, the public is aware of those items. There will be times where uh, you all may need to call a special meeting uh, because an issue has become emergent and there's a need to, to move forward on a particular issue or question. And on those special meetings, it's a 48 hour notice. So that gives you a little bit of time. Uh, you don't have to worry about the mechanics of it, the DPI team and the legal team here will make sure we comply with those. But if you know that there's a special meeting, you know that you've got a, a two-day notice period before that meeting can occur. Is that two business days or just two calendar? Two calendar days. 
Now, with respect to emergency meetings, I mean, those are truly the those are truly emergency meetings where there would be something dire that needs to be addressed or something that's unexpected. Um, occasionally, the state board will have those. Charter school advisory board will have those, and because of the nature of the of the issue that needs to be discussed, you know, one moves the the board moves quickly uh, at a time when it can have quorum and then proceed. Um, so there's not a time limit on those, but again, there's sort of a reasonableness function in terms of uh, just a, in terms of how it works here. In the event of an emergency meeting, uh, members of the commission would be I'd, would be notified of it, and then there's a press list uh, that would get sort of a, a notif they would get pinged via email or call um, so that they are aware of that notice and we would also get it posted online. Again, only surprise situations merit the emergency meeting. Uh, it will be an exciting day if the Pepsi Commission has an emergency meeting. Okay, and of course, since these are public meetings, there are going to be minutes from them. Um, so we will... Uh, Keep those and make those available to the public as well. Um, you know, you can find those online. We had a nice discussion about minutes here this morning. And of course, we have the audio stream available as well. And those, those minutes are, of course, approved. Make sure that the commission agrees that they reflect what actually happened in the meeting. Additional formalities. Uh, uh, Dr. Miller reads the ethics statement to start off each of our public meetings, so you're already familiar with that. Um, I don't know if the Pepsi Commission has gone into closed session or not yet. I don't know if it'll have occasion to do so. Um, but in the event you go into closed session, there are a number of reasons outlined in statute that are essentially exceptions to doing your work out here in open and public. Um, you know, sometimes this can apply to, you know, again, it has to be in an official meeting in order to go into closed session. And there would be a motion uh, that you know, someone would move and be seconded, and then you would, we would turn off the audio stream, and um, this group would talk with the lawyers about whatever legal issue came up that wasn't in the in the body, or was, was not a, a discussed appropriately here in the body. Um, so, for example, you have confidential records that can sometimes be something discussed and closed, attorney-client privilege matters, um, to the extent this group was looking to enter into a contract negotiation, uh, those kinds of matters can be discussed and closed as well, and including specific personnel matters. All right, so if a group, any public group is not following its rule, following necessary rules with respect to public meetings, uh, interested parties in the public can seek an injunction to stop the improper practice. Um, and a failure to do process right, to do process in the correct way, can sometimes invalidate action as well. Um, I've included some uh, resources here in the slides, some useful uh, websites, and a couple books just in time for Father's Day, if you're so inclined. Um, but if you have uh, a great interest in these issues, uh, those are some excellent resources. And I will also provide to Kim and Andrew some great one-pagers from the Attorney General's Office and, Depart and, and uh, DOJ on public records and open meetings, just so that you've got, and I've got hard copies here for folks that I'll pass out at the end. Um, they are just good to put in your file if you have a question, because um, they really, in one page, will answer any burning question you have about public records or open meetings. Any questions? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the commission work and subcommittees. And there'll be a little bit of overlap uh, regarding uh, open meetings when we talk about subcommittees. Okay, so of course you already know your commission purpose and your subcommittee is just a way for this group to move forward on, on its important charge in a way that's really focused um, uh, allows you all to be deliberative and really uh, get to the, you know, get into the nitty gritty details on the kinds of questions that have been going around this table related to licensure policy, um, 
It can be, you know, very detailed oriented things or can be, you know, larger questions about what, you know, what really ought to be our focus, you know, where should we put in our energy, what are our values here in North Carolina. Subcommittees are a great place to sharpen those issues and bring a really fully formed discussion to the board um, so that committee members can really leverage the resources here at DPI to get you the information you need to make informed decisions and, and really focus, uh, focus your debates. All right, so uh, again, some, you, you all are already familiar with your work, um, you know, educator prep policy drafts, looking at revisions, um, uh, suggesting revisions to DPI staff. Um, you'll have, you'll have uh, a lot of road to use here if you, if you like as you look at these issues, um, as you get to make policy recommendations to the state board. Uh, and the, I think the real vehicle um, to investigate the things you want to do and move them forward and decide what not to move forward is, is your subcommittees. All right, so we've got subcommittees for educator prep, licensure, assessment, performance, and uh, congratulations to, or congratulations or condolences to the chairs and vice chairs of these committees. Um, and Dr. Miller's uh, overview of how the, the process is to work, I think, is a very good one and I think very clear guidance on, on how uh, your groups should proceed in subcommittees. Um, so chairs and vice chairs, uh, you, if you don't already have uh, Andrew and Tom and Kim's numbers committed to heart or in your favorites in your phone, you probably will soon. Um, again, that DPI staff is here to offer you assistance and help you structure um, the things you're interested in working on in your subcommittee. And as you all sit around the table or on your conference call lines in subcommittees, you know, issues are going to pop up that may or may not fit in, in the particular subcommittee you're working on. So as those issues come up, because you all are thinking about this from a number of different perspectives and are, are, are thinking broadly about making, um, you know, making systems better, when issues that aren't exactly in your subcommittee come up, funnel those back to uh, our friends here at DPI and they can pass that information along and uh, help connect that conversation to other subcommittees. Um, chairs and vice chairs also, of course, will be your job to you know, reach out to those on your committee to bring them up to speed on issues and solicit their input, task them with, with uh, uh, different assignments. But look at this, you know, note well this bottom bullet point here. If two or more of your subcommittee members meet, then we run into an open meetings question. This is what we have five, five members on each subcommittee at least. Yes. And so once, once you hit, you know, really once folks start doing, um, I, this is a, just a good rule. If you've got more than three members of the commission on the call, press pause because you may be in public meeting territory where you needed to be noticed and setting up minutes and, and, and uh, you know, making, making your meeting available to everyone. So I think that's just a good rule. Um, sometimes it's a strict rule. I know uh, our state board follows this rule as well. If we think a third member of our board is gonna hop onto a call because he or she is interested, it may be appropriate to have a public meeting in that case. It may be appropriate to notice and have an important subcommittee meeting that, that was really opened up and to mind those additional formalities. Um, that's really going to be a, a chair and vice chair decision. But so often um, it's easier to connect offline later with those other committee members to bring them up to speed or to solicit their input. Uh, just so that the machinery doesn't get in the way of the work you're trying to do. Um, typically, our, sub, our subcommittee calls for the state board are very focused. DPI is on the call to help out and work through materials with you. Um, but they're, they're informal conference calls. And that, I think, opens up for an easier dialogue and way to get stuff done. It's, the subcommittee calls that I've seen are really your chance to roll up your sleeves dive in, get that work done without having to worry about, okay, do we have someone to keep minutes? Have we got our notice posted? Do I have the ethics uh, statement in front of me? Let's keep it close, let's keep it focused, and let's roll up our sleeves is really the purpose of those, 
subcommittee sub subcommittee meetings so that you can bring all that great work to the board here and uh, r report report your findings and and uh, different viewpoints. And maybe I stole my thunder on this next slide, but really it is about um, flexibility to you know root around these issues um, that you're all grappling with. I think it's also important to note here that. I think there's a. I think it's fair to say there's a different expectation for pace of work on subcommittees. I, you all have been charging really hard now for months to get through these licensure policies, and subcommittee work is a real place where you can do this policy making policy making work. And sometimes the pace of that is necessarily very fast because something needs to be addressed. But other times, if it's building consensus and really digging in. It may take a little bit longer to bring something fully formed to the board or to reach a point where the whole board ought to be engaged on a particular issue or project. You know, that, that question of pace is really one that um, chairs and vice chairs of subcommittees should work with their committee members and the, and the, chair, of the and chair of the Pepsi to figure out sort of what's the, what's the right balance, what's the right approach. Um, you know, there are times when those subcommittees will be very busy. There'll be times when, you know, regular work just works at the pace that it, that it goes at. So I, I leave that to your good judgment and, and priorities. Um, and, I, and I think the important piece here is that uh, those subcommittees can really stay on topic and really investigate with, with rigor and care over time to try to fashion the right solutions and either find consensus or sharpen those areas where there may be some disagreement. Um, do keep in mind that those public records obligations continue. Uh, just because you're in subcommittee doesn't mean it's not a public record. It still is a public record. Any questions on subcommittees, that subcommittee work? I know Dr. Miller's instructions I thought were uh, very much on point. The um, Open meetings and public records are, I think, worth talking about in relation to subcommittees just to keep those things in mind so that uh, with respect to formalities, you uh, continue to meet them if, if a subcommittee you know, goes beyond those two members. And just a good reminder that since your subcommittee work is public work, so it's going to be in the open too. Okay. Thank you, Eric. We appreciate you taking the time to share this information with us this morning. One last shot at questions for Eric. I'm going to resist this. I should step away from the microphone, but let me just say this. I will uh, send to Kim those two one-pagers on public meetings and open records, and I'm also going to send you uh, a great parliamentary procedure cheat sheet that I keep in my folder all the time that talks about different kinds of motions, um, that talks about different sorts of orders of motions as they come to the floor and different pieces of personal privilege. I know on these conference calls meetings, conference call meetings, sometimes it's difficult to hear the speaker or the technology can create some problems. Uh, this cheat sheet will give you some magic language to, you know, very formally and nicely ask the chair to uh, give you whatever you need so you can fully participate. But thank you all for your attention and for your continued work on the commission and uh, your willingness to mind our open meetings and public records laws. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I'll resist asking for the ISBA. <laughs> I appreciate that. The Amazon reviews are great. <laughs> right, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Commission members, advisors, and staff for your preparation for the discussions. I remind Commission members that our next standing meeting will be held in this room on Thursday, August 9th from 9 a.m. until noon. We have now completed our meeting, and unless there is additional business at this time, I ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you.